Hello, everyone. So, this um, uh, afternoon, beautiful afternoon here in Sweden, uh, evening in, in India and uh, and morning in the U.S., uh, I uh, would like to take a little moment or time here to talk about how this cloud challenge, of course, it is uh, wonderfully technical and geeky and nerdy and all the things we love. It is also more than that. And I think it's very important to recognize the challenges, the opportunities, but the things that happen in organizations when they go on this cloud journey. So this is a favorite conversation of mine that I really, really enjoy talking about. So like this cloud challenge, it's much more than just the technical stuff because there are people, right? So, and, and the thing, the reason, let's hide that, right, there we go. The thing is, is with people that when you add people to anything, it gets messy. It's just, it's just a matter of fact. And I would like to share a few things that I have seen with customers that I have noticed over time where, you know, common pitfalls, common challenges inside organizations that I think are kind of useful to listen to. Before we get into that, I'd like to draw attention, of course, to the Global Azure um, events that we have been running for many years. It's when all communities in the world that have an interest in joining in a conversation about the Azure cloud all together at one specific time. Uh, in this, this case here last, it was 20, 23rd to 25th of April, so a little while ago. And of course, with this pandemic and all the things going on, we had to quickly rearrange everything and throw this as an online thing. Uh, the year before, uh, last last spring again, uh, that was a huge year for Global Azure. I believe there were over 20,000 people attending in I don't even know how many countries anymore, but over 300 locations, 329 or something. But quickly for the pandemic, we had to cancel, of course, to meet up physically and we we threw this online event and it turned out beautifully. So many speakers joined and, and spoke at this event from everywhere, from their living room, from their kitchen, from all over the world, um, just, just joined and added their sessions. And we linked off to whatever technology they used to stream. Uh, you know, they could have used StreamYard or, or they went on YouTube live and, and they did everything they could to you know, share because they cannot do anything else. So I really want to appreciate, take a moment to really thank and appreciate all the great speakers that make this possible, community spirits around the world. Absolutely beautiful. So here we are. It's 2020. Some stuff is going on in the world, but the cloud, though, is also going on. It's really growing, and it's really everywhere these days. Uh, India still have three data centers, US, I don't even know how many in the US have in Europe, it's just throwing up new data centers everywhere. South Africa is recent, recently added to, to, to add Africa to the map of, of the locations or continents that have Azure finally. And you know, there are several new ones popping up in Poland, Spain and Italy and so forth, even Mexico, Israel and so forth. It is really growing and it's really on everyone's mind these days. It is huge, it is everywhere, it's dominating and it's it's a solid trend. Uh, there is no cloud in that sky to, to, to use a, a weird joke in this context, right? It's cloudy, but it's, it's not gonna change. It's gonna be the same for, for a good long time. And what's really happened is kind of important to observe. I, I believe many of you have probably seen this this chart here, which is called the technology adoption life cycle. So it's a classic by now because it's from like the 50s, the 40s, uh, when they started talking about this technology adoption life cycle that whatever technology wants to do is go beyond the innovators and early adopters and kind of jump this, this gap, this chasm here and come into the mainstream, if you will. Um, this chasm, this this gap is called the, you know, and if, if you want to make it funny, it's called like the, the chasm of doom. That's where bad technology falls in and dies and, and gets forgotten. 
But good technology jumps that and gets into that large middle section, which is about 80% of the market. And that's when kind of everyone wants it. You know, if they didn't want it before, they thought that cloudy thing would go away. Eh, whatever, it's going to be sunny soon, so we're not, we're not going to have any more clouds. Forget about that. When it comes into mainstream, everybody wants it. And that's what people like myself we're seeing now. I've been in the cloud for over 10 years, since the very beginning of cloud, and I've been an Azure MVP now eight times, right? And, and that means that I've been there for the duration, which means that I was there when it was almost innovator steps, early, early, early adopters, the very beginning, when kind of nobody wanted cloud, but now everybody wants it, which means that there is a big shortage of actual experts, actual experienced experts, because there are so many companies that want to do this now. That translates into a really nice opportunity for people such as, well, me, thank you, but, but such as us, uh, technology experts, if you want to have a good solid future in technology, a really nice approach would be actually to, to think about cloud and think about the real challenges of cloud, those that are holding companies back, that are hindering adoption, that are slowing down approaches to the cloud, which are those? What can we do to uh, become knowledgeable in those areas? That's what's really going to help you get a good job or get something really fun to do because the greatness about that is if you can solve the sticky problems about cloud for people, then you're gonna be somebody who everybody wants to hang out with. Because if you really think about it now, this whole cloudy thingy, which is so huge now, it actually means the largest IT migration in history because there is so much IT moving continuously. And it, to be honest, the vast majority of compute in the world by far, like 80, 90% probably is, or even more, is still not cloud. You hear about cloud, it's all the rage and all the buzz, and you think everything is cloud, <laughs> really isn't. Only a fraction, a small portion is cloud. But we are migrating lots of things and going to the cloud in, in, in massive, massive quantities. So I would say as a market, this is absolutely beautiful. You'll be working with some very interesting companies, and I'd like to frame the conversation today or the this this keynote today around this fictive company. You know, there was a company once upon a time who was migrating or going to the cloud. It may or may not have, you know, connections to things that I'm telling to my real customers, maybe, but I'm not gonna tell. What I am gonna tell is that this company, Acme, had a boardroom, it's a pretty big company. So they had a, a, a board of directors and this is what they looked like. So this is the Acme boardroom. And as you can see, all of the people in Acme, they're starting to think about cloud, 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 cloud. That's all they have on their mind. And so they make this wonderful big boardroom decision like big, big boardroom people do. Yes, we shall now be cloudy. We are going to the cloud. Beautiful decision made, lovely. So go tell the tech people to, to make us cloudy. As you all know, the road to hell is sometimes known to be paved with good intentions. They're not being bad people. They just are not really knowledgeable about what it is that it means, what it entails, what's going to happen to their organization when they say, let's go to the cloud. Okay? This is a problem because of things like this. You know, the Acme is a big company, right? So they think that, you know, we are so large, we're an enterprise, so we need to be multi-cloud. We cannot focus on just one cloud and sort of put all of our eggs in just one cloud basket. No, 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 we have to be multi-cloud because there are several big clouds and we can't just you know, bet on just one. Good decision there. Yes, very good boardroom decision, lovely. <clears throat> what does this mean? Well, it turns out it means things that you have to have now two solutions for all the things that you do. For instance, cost management. You have to collect all your, let's say we're using, let's go with Azure and, and, and Amazon here, right? So 
They decide to focus on Azure and Amazon because they seem to be big clouds. Let's do that, yes. So now they have one solution for cost management in Azure. They have another solution for cost management over in Amazon. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it sounds good to begin with, but you're actually essentially you're doubling the development efforts here because you need the answers from both. How much is Azure costing us? How much is Amazon costing us? You need that. The, the financial people need, need all the numbers of all the consumption. What, what's the cost? So turns out this is wonderful, the Azure people say, because you know what? The Azure sort of the people inside of Acme that like Azure, right? The Azure folks. You know, there's a new connector for AWS accounts so that in Azure, so that we can connect to AWS and pull the AWS consumption data into Azure and use that together, you know, join the silos of data and use that data in one context. And now beautifully, we have one solution for cost management data. Isn't this great? Isn't this lovely? We all love this, don't we? Except if you're an AWS focused employee at Acme, you like AWS, AWS is awesome. It's beautiful. It's absolutely wonderful. You know what the AWS people at Acme looked like when they heard that there was a suggestion to pull AWS cost management data over to Azure? Yeah, they looked like this. They were like, no, we don't want to. We don't want to pull our data over to Azure. No. That's exactly what they sounded like. I'm not kidding. That's precisely the quote. And then this became a bother for the management board. They were like, how are we going to solve this? This is a pickle. Hmm. I don't even know. What, what should we do? Here's what we do. Let's focus more on one cloud because this, this kind of multi-cloud thing, it, it, it became old really quickly. Let's focus a little bit more on one cloud. So let's go to the technical people and let's ask them to give us a, uh, some sort of a, you know, which cloud are we going to choose? We don't know because we're not technical. So let's ask the technical people. Let's go to the technical people and we'll ask them. You know, tell us which cloud should we focus on the most. We'll have the other one as well, but we'll let's give us, you know, by tomorrow, give us some information so that we can make our 70-30 cloud split. Yeah. Great boardroom decision there. Because now really they, they really made sure that within the company people really want to stab each other in the back and kill each other in the hallways. Absolutely beautiful decision. Now again. The boardroom people at Acme are not bad people. They just don't know what it is they're actually making a decision about, right? Here's the problem, right? So the lack of cloud skills is hurting Acme a lot. Even the boardroom, of course, but within the company, you know, you can't find enough people because Acme wasn't a cloud company. It's a big company and they have all this IT staff, right, in Acme that have been in the company for years. They have their own data centers. You know, they have lots of servers, hundreds, you know, even maybe thousands, let's pretend, right? Acme is a big company. They have so many servers. They have server rooms. They have failover geographical locations. Big, big company. Fantastic. Okay, but now that we're moving to the cloud, the thing is, a lot of people will be excited inside of Acme. Finally, we get to work with new technologies. Thank you. Oh my gosh, right? But also, huh, you'll get these people, right? The people that go, well, this is the way we've always done it. I don't want to get, I don't want to go on a cloud journey. I don't want to change. You know, change is, is dangerous. Change is scary. I love this picture, by the way. It's a it's an automobile, right? It's a, it's a wagon which is automatically able to be mobile on its own without a horse. And just to not scare people too much when you come down the street without a horse in front of the buggy, you kind of add this horse, fake horse front to the to the buggy to, to make sure that people don't get too afraid. So when you have a lot of people that have done things a certain way for a long time, 
it takes a while for people to, to get used to that. And here's a, a beautiful picture from New York City. Uh, I can't remember the, it's, nine, it's like uh, 1900, right? So it's, it's 120 years ago. This is Fifth Avenue in New York City. And sure enough, there's an automobile there. I believe there's supposed to be a couple of more. I think there's one over there maybe, but I, I haven't really, I'm, I'm not really sure. There's supposed to be a couple of them, but as you can see, mostly horse and that horse and wagons, right? So that's what you kind of need to bridge. And a challenge here is that in the beginning of the cloud, the, the early adopters, the excited people about cloud, they went about this all the wrong way because many of us, you know, including myself, I'm so sorry, that was rude really, really uncalled for and very, very rude. We kind of said that, hey, if you're an IT person in the future, we're not gonna need you. You're all gonna lose your jobs. You're gonna drive taxi cabs. And so rude and so wrong. Like I didn't want to maintain and, and handle IT resources and you know monitor uh, systems and stuff before as a developer. That's my heart as a developer. And I really don't wanna do it in the cloud anyway, right? For those in IT, I'm sure there's going to be some that will not want to change enough. You know, I don't want to do this cloud journey. I'm about to go into retirement. I'm not interested in learning new things much. You're right. But you're also going to find, you know, people that will be so excited and jump into this cloud thing. And really today, you know, in the beginning of the cloud, it was a much, much about developers but that has turned around many years ago by now to really, really enable IT people to be this all powerful, superhuman people that can do, you know, just great men and women who work in IT and who can really just create everything for you. Once upon a time, you had to like fill out a physical form, stand in line in the, at the IT office and hand in to request a, a, a database, right? And sometime eventually, uh, weeks or months later, you'd get your database. But now there's no limit, no limit at all to what IT people can do in the cloud. I'm actually quite jealous for not being an IT person of, of how much they can do now. But the developer, oh, sorry, wrong way. <laughs> the developer staff at Acme, they're not exempt from these challenges themselves. No, no, no. Now they have all this new power. They already know they can do some really, really cool stuff. They can use microservices. That's a really hot architectural concept. They can go serverless. They can use containers. Fantastic, love all that. Hmm. You know, on, honestly, that's kind of known as, if you pardon the expression, developer porn. I'll, I'll, go, to, I'll go to Yoda. Let's go to Yoda and get a quote. Once you start down the dark path, forever it will dominate your destiny. Consume you it will, right? That's the problem, that you should use microservices. Absolutely, that's a great architectural paradigm. Serverless is beautiful, wonderful things. Containers, kind of hard to manage still, getting better, but really, really cool technology and really powerful, absolutely. If you have the staff for this, if you have the people for it. It's not enough to have an excited, wonderfully talented architect who knows all about microservices. It's not enough to have a person in the company who is used to this serverless paradigm. You have to have teams of these people or you have to start training so that people can onboard with the concept and can be on board with this and this change and understand how to do it. I've seen countless times companies that kind of go all in with all these new, you know, ra raging new wonderful things and that, are, that are hot and cool and at the same time, both hot and cool. And they, they, they struggle because it's not easy to move forward. And some of the things they struggle with is security, big area, monitoring and automation. So let's, let's spend a few minutes, go through each one of these. I'll give a couple of examples and I'll tell you about where you should focus. So, so keep these three in mind, learn about these three things in the cloud of your choosing. I choose Azure myself, right? But in the cloud, learn about these three, three things because I see basically all or literally all my customers are struggling in these areas. So if you can become a wizard here, 
you're going to be really, really hot on the job market. Security. The first thing to know about cloud is that security is a shared responsibility. So this is a, one of the classic uh, pictures in that space to sort of describe this. This is actually function as a service, but it works equally for any cloud sort of technology out there. The cloud provider provides you with access to compute, to storage, to databases, all the things. It helps you with failover between different regions and you know, the, you get availability zones, you get all the, all the things, networking, everything is there. And um, additionally, in a secure way, because that part, handling that security is your provider's responsibility. On the flip side of that, your responsibility is to understand how to take advantage of these services securely, how to manage the, such things as identity and access management, how to, you know, how to handle if your data is secure in transit. And, and there's lots of things that you need to understand as an application owner, as a customer of a cloud. This is a challenge, and this is a place where, you know, companies like Acme are challenging challenged and and there's there's some real issues here one is time and here's an example of time right this is the acme cto and he's saying we have to get this service out to the customers now right we'll 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 here's how we're going to do it um just because it's kind of make it makes everything more easy what we're going to do is we're going to make all the developers owner of the subscription just for now because then all the developers can make all the changes that they need to do and then tomorrow we'll set up this secure operations. We'll do that later because we're under time pressure. We have to get this out to the customers now. There's a really good song by Garth Brooks from 89, popularized by Ronan Keating that kind of speaks to this problem, if tomorrow never comes. So for Acme, of course, years later, they still had not set up any SecOps, right? So, um, and, and also when you go to, to Acme and you go into sec the thing called Security Center in Azure, you click into Security Center and there's all these things that happen inside of the Security Center. It's actually a bad example because there's not much red in there. Um, if you go into any companies, if you go to your company, I'm sorry, but let's, let's do that, right? If you haven't been in Security Center and you work in a company that do a lot of, of cloud uh, or Azure cloud, you go to Security Center, if everything is green in there, you know, call me up. I'll send you a prize or something because there's always something red in there. There's always something bad in there. And, and that's terrible and sad, of course, but um, it has to be somebody's job, right? It has to be somebody's job to actually go in here and fix things because there's a lot of security concerns that kind of needs maintenance continuously, upgrading servers, making sure that the new server deployed doesn't have an open port to the internet. There's always stuff and it has, you have to have a security operations team that takes care of these things. It just doesn't work otherwise. And here's another one that I really like as well in the security space. So the central operations team in Acme said that here's what we're gonna do. They learned about the key vaults. In Azure, there's something called a key vault, which means that you can take whatever secret, a string or a certif certificate, and you can put it in a so-called key vault and then securely access this key vault and maintain your secrets in this vault. So it's a, it's a handy tool to help you enhance security, your security posture inside of the company. So it, it's a good thing to use. So when you deploy, you go and you want to make a deployment to your, your Azure resources, you come and fetch this secret from us, from the key vault. We will not give you the secret. You're not supposed to take the secret and store it on your own because then Acme has a problem, right? Acme has to know that everybody that stores a secret will store it securely and handle it, you know, you know responsibly and only a few people have access to it and all these things that you have to do. So instead they said, no, 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 we will not give you the secrets. The secret stays with us. Can you imagine the face that some of the Acme employees made when they saw that? Why am I not trustworthy? I can keep a secret, no problem. 
so again, people, right? So what we had to do with this customer, what we had to do, we had to go on sort of a sort of a, a crusade around the company to, to explain. We had to go on a tour to talk to the people. So here's what we're about. We're, we're the operations team. We want to enable you. We want you to be able to do all the things you need, but you don't need to keep the secrets. You need to do the things you need to do, but we will keep the secret. And oh, by the way, here's how you keep the secrets. Here's how you access the secrets from us so that you can do all the things you need, but you don't have to worry about keeping secrets. And this is what Acme staff looked like after that. But it turned out that was actually a big thing that we had to handle. So please bear in mind, among the things that will not be added later, number one is security. Let's turn to monitoring. I've been using this uh, notion for a while and it's, it's so true that I, I really, the best way to phrase monitoring or the need for monitoring is this. You are always being measured when you're using a cloud platform, always measured every bit and byte, everything you send and receive, all the things you store, you get an exact bill at the end of the month. If you use it, you pay for it. So the thing is that you are being measured. They, your cloud provider, they measure you. Your obvious response here is you also measure you. That's how you know what it costs. And the beginning, the first and last, the, the beginning and end all of quotes in, in this space is by Dr. H. James Harrington. I love this quote and you should remember this because you don't need any other monitoring quotes ever. Measurement is the first step that leads to control and eventually to improvement. If you can't measure something, you can't understand it. If you can't understand it, you can't control it. And if you can't control it, you can't improve it, right? So for Acme, that meant that they cannot measure their return on investment. They don't know exactly which cost what. They don't know how much of the cloud bill is development and how much of it is the production system in the US, how much is the other production system in Europe and how much is test costing them. They don't know their business is essentially blind. And what's worth it, worse is, is that they, they cannot be responsible when everything is just a lump sum. So on the list of things that will not be added later, number two is, is monitoring. Let's turn to automation. So we're kind of in a rush here. It's a little bit sticky. We have to be quick about this and get on the market fast. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do it manual for now and automated later. Smart, right? You know, because that's such a time saver, not worry about setting up that all of that automation. We'll just make sure that we, we get it out there quickly now, just manual for now. Yeah. The thing is that you really need to view your service delivery as an automobile factory, in this case, a Ford factory, right? You have to have a, um, a conveyor belt of deployments. And, and here's my measurement stick. Here's what you should do at your own company or at your client. You should go to them and you should go to their test environment in the cloud. So here's a test environment in the cloud. And, and you should hover with your mouse pointer over the delete button to delete that test environment. So if that's okay, if I can go into your company and delete your test environment without you freaking out as hell, going like, no, 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 don't touch that. No, I set it up just right. Do not delete, do not touch that. Well, then you have an issue. If I can just go and, and hover over the delete button and I feel so, someone who's cool as a cucumber going like, yeah, fine, you delete that, that, go ahead. And I delete it and they can just fire something off to deploy the whole test environment again. Then you probably have automated an appropriate amount. That's a really, really good test because if a company can have that posture of being able to fire up a test environment, run some tests and throw it away, it means so many things. It means that they can shut down development environments over the weekend when nobody is using them or over the holidays if you want to. And, and over the night, 
But if you can't, if you can't do that, you're stuck in the land of manual deployments and human errors and things you don't want at all. So you, what you need to do is automate, automate, automate. And, and the thing you need to know about automation or the word automate, 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 is that you have to always say it three times because if you don't, it's not gonna work. It's like a little incantation. So everything that you can automate, you have to, you must automate it. It's just the way it is because you will make that time back over and over and over again. And as I mentioned, Acme does not shut down development and test over the weekend. So essentially, Acme is giving away free money to Azure. Azure as shareholders, Microsoft shareholders say thank you to Acme because they're being so irresponsible. They're not taking the time, one-time investment to automate so that they can then delete development, delete tests. Over the weekend, Friday afternoon, throw it all away, go have a beer, have a great weekend, and have an automated deployment that starts up at 6 a.m. or 6 in the morning uh, in, 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 on Monday morning. And when people come in to get their Monday morning coffee, the development and test environment is back. Save that money over the weekend. It is worth it. Spend that money on the next party uh, for your company instead. Right. So another problem when people have this actually falls back to security um, a little bit um, is this bug in production, right? There's only a bug in production. You throw up a test environment and you try to run that. And there's, you know, it doesn't, it, the, the bug doesn't show up in, in test. It's only in, autumn, in, in, in production. Well, I cannot tell you how many times I have worked with customers that have been chasing bugs. You know, they've been chasing ghosts, essentially, because their QA environment turned out, you know, days later, many, many hours spent, customers are pissed off, and they find out that the QA environment does not equal the production environment. And that's because too many people have too much access, and it's because people are making manual changes, manual deployments, if you automate that, if you automate the provisioning of the resources, if you automate the deployment of the code, you're able to actually make a complete copy of production, make the test, make sure you find the problem, solve the bug, redeploy, test is the bug fixed, yes, move to production. Seriously, <laughs> I cannot overstate this. So on the list of things that will not be added later, number three is automation. So tell me now, what do all of these Acme challenges have in common? One thing, people with good intentions. The people of Acme are not bad people. The people of Acme are not bad at their jobs. They're good at them. They just don't necessarily have the right amount of experience or the right staff at the right place. So get, get you know, on, um, get upskilled learn about the cloud, become more proficient, and you know, really learn how to become a good person in the cloud. So right, we have an online thing here, so it's kind of difficult maybe for questions. We'll check it at the end in a few minutes here if we have um, someone who can, uh, can do, uh, you know, if there's a question from anyone. So if you have a question, tweet it or, or something like that, and we can see if we can do that in a few minutes. But let's go to some final advice. <clears throat> An enterprise cloud operations trenches kind of uh, realization that I found is that you must, you must appoint a resource owner with a budget. What does that mean and what does that entail? Well, first of all, I'll tell you what it entails. You have to be able to tag your resources and pile up the costs in different buckets. So you know how much does development cost, you know how much does test cost and production and so forth. And, and you have enabled this within the organization. And not only have you enabled the data collection because I've seen that, but nobody's using the data, right? You collected all the data, but nobody knows what it means. So you have to collect it and then you have to make sure that your company learns how to look at this data and figure out what the different costs are. And then you set up budgets. There's budgets feature in Azure, you do whatever you do, you set up budgets and you say, hey, development team, development lead, 
here's the cost, here's the budget for your development. And um, next month over, if the budget is, is uh, you know, over, if you're over budget, go back and you check the numbers and you start to question, what did, why, why did we raise the cost between month, last month and this month by 15%? What's the reason for the raise of cost? Well, turns out we have some servers standing around idly that somebody tested something on and then just left running and forgot about, right? You have to enable people, you know, responsible, great, hardworking people that love their job, that love to work with the cloud, that really want to be able to do the right thing. You have to enable them to do the right thing. So set up all this stuff so that you can get responsible people to be able to be accountable and take a responsibility. Because this means that the, the development team have to take a look at, you know, learning how to shut down servers they're not using on maybe a timer every evening or over the weekend, they have to learn to optimize, to conserve their budget. And, and if they need more, you know, if they, read, if they can motivate that they need more money, I'm sure they can get it, but they have to first learn how to save money, right? So this is the single biggest enabler, because if you look at this in production, if you have budgets for production, you are, acutely interested, the person who owns the production, right, who, who is responsible for the production environment is acute, or maybe a team, right, is acutely interested in understanding how they can optimize because they have to have satisfied customers, but they can't just add more servers, add more compute, add more power if there's, uh, somebody rings up and says, you know what, the service is slow again and so forth. Well, let's just add more servers, no problem, more power, more power. What happens then is that the cost will go up, right? If you're not able to be accountable for that, I kid you not, I found two clusters, five and five VMs. I found 10 virtual machines with a customer that had been running for several months, like three, four months, these servers had been running. Nobody owned them. Nobody was responsible for them. They were just running. They were just throwing money. They were burning it, right? And that's terrible. <clears throat> so you have to be able to make people responsible. And that's super important. And if you're able to do that, uh, people will be interested in monitoring. People will be interested in optimization. People will be interested in automation. Da, right? Get to it, this is important. And uh, the, in the cloud, Azure, what Azure have done, what Microsoft has done with Azure, they have gathered up so much information about the cloud in something called the Cloud Adoption Framework. It's really big, <laughs> There's, oh my God, there's well over a thousand pages in this thing, but it gives you, it helps you get an overview of all the things that you might need to do, right? You get a complete list of things, that's, that's great. So you get an overview and you get a complete list here are all the concerns, all the things. I mean, not everyone is an enterprise, right? Absolutely. I mean, you can be a really small startup as well, but it would still be worth uh, while for, for, any, for a company of any size to take a look at the cloud adoption framework, which kind of boils down lots and lots of experiences from many customers, from many partners, from Microsoft internally and everywhere. You kind of pour this into the cloud adoption framework for Azure. And if you go in there and you look around and you're, Get, get to know it and learn and understand. I mean, you're maybe you won't need an enterprise scale landing zone and stuff like that. Fine, ignore that, but understand the sort of the big strokes in there. Which are the areas that are important? That's a really, really good, good place to go to. You can also go to the uh, Azure Architecture Center and study architecture in Azure. Look into the different uh, deployments, different solutions that are in there. Take a look at what's in, the, in, in, in those solutions. How did they build those solutions? Which Azure resources were used? That's really, really handy. And, and uh, if it wasn't clear from what I said before, in Azure, I actually didn't mention, there's something called the Azure Monitor. So in Azure Monitor, there's a really, really good page, the Get Started page, and there's a What's New, and there's a Tutorials and Demos, as you can see here, right? Uh, you go to Azure Monitor in Azure, and you invest. If you want to learn to become valuable inside of your company and you haven't really looked into monitoring Azure, take it upon yourself as a person, right? Or, or as a company, invest. Put some people in there to go and study and understand about Azure Monitor. There's so much help in there. 
and there's so much value. And I see companies, enterprises working with Azure that haven't really opened up Monitor. It's ludicrous. There's so much value in there. The same with the security center. We talked about that before. There has to be a team. There has to be someone who is responsible for going into the Azure security center to check it out and, and make sure that, you know, this, this, secure score here, which is 22%, that's maybe too low, right? We have to go up. We have to raise the secure score. What are the things we need to do? Go in here and understand this has to be someone's job to go in here and understand what do we need to do to move that needle and, and raise the secure score for our company, for our applications. Well, you have to understand what there, what is in there. You have to make that into work items in the backlog and you have to get someone to actually start working on that. So important. And uh, <clears throat> just for fun, if you have a bunch of stuff on-prem, lots of things on-prem and you're moving to the cloud, it's gonna start out with some little small things in the cloud to begin with. And, and uh, maybe that cloud part of the, the, the business is not really going to be financially viable or carry the business. So what you're gonna do is you're going to have, <coughs> excuse me, things on the, on the ground as well, on, not in the cloud, right? And so and this is, of course, Wiley Coyote, and he's, uh, he's jumped off the cliff. He's trying to fly, right? So he's hanging in midair, and we don't actually honestly know if he's going to fly or fall yet. Well, by experience, we know he's, he's actually going to fall, but, but you don't know. You're in limbo. And that's similar to when you have a bunch of things on the ground and a bunch of things in the cloud. I'm not saying at all that you have to actually move all the things you have to the cloud. Some things don't belong in the cloud, but make sure you know which ones those are and don't <clears throat> sort of straddle the cloud, one dragging one foot in the ground and trying to fly it and take off at the same time when you have your application deployed on the ground for some customers and in the cloud for other customers. Well, I mean, maybe you have to in the beginning, but eventually you have to make a hard cut and say, hey, um, customers who are not in the cloud version of our, of our service, Sorry, but you have to move now. We'll give you a discount, but you have to move, right? Uh, because this, uh, this this thing, this limbo state where you don't know if you're going to fly or fall, it's going to cost you. You're going to have you know a fork in the road of your code base. You're going to double the security, um, um, the the this risk of security flaws because you're going to have them in both places, and you're going to have to like you know publish code to both both versions and it's gonna be a mess. And again, I do not care if you deploy your code, uh, your sorry, your, your production application to on-premise, I don't care. Go ahead and do that. Some applications do not belong in the cloud for various good reasons, but you have to, you must use the cloud for development and test. It's not even funny. Just do it, it's, there's no other way. And, and if you can, start moving to platform services. Don't just migrate your VMs to the cloud. Start moving to, to platform services because it is kind of inevitable and it's really awesome sauce when you get there. So do it now. You don't have to do it all in one big go. You start your journey kind of small uh, with just like a, one small application and you build from there, you learn. That's actually a part of the, there's, there's information about this inside of the cloud adoption framework. How, what's the journey? What do you do as a company, as a, as a, as a team to learn? You start with something small and you grow from there. So honestly, I think that's about it. So whew, it is hot here in Sweden and I'm, I'm kind of done. I'm definitely hot and, and, and finished. So thank you. Thank you for the attention and thank you for listening today and uh, basically back to the studio.